Welcome to week three of the Illinois Pork Expo video series. Today we will get a market update from Dustin Baker of CIH Commodity and Ingredient Hedging. As a manager on the education and research team, Dustin helps market participants gain a better understanding of agriculture margin management concepts and strategies. He also contributes to CIH publications that focus on risk management for ag producers and buyers. Dustin grew up on a livestock farm in Michigan, and prior to joining CIH, he spent five years in Washington, D.C., working for ag trade associations representing the dairy and pork industries. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Thanks a lot to Illinois Pork for the invitation. Uh, my name is Dustin Baker, and I'm with Commodity and Ingredient Hedging uh, based out of Chicago. And I'm here to provide a market outlook and an overview of the pork cutout futures that were rolled out by the CME group uh, back in November. So we got a lot to cover here over the next hour or so. Uh, so without any further ado, we'll kind of move forward. But for those of you who aren't that familiar with CIH, I know a lot of you will be, uh, but, but commodity and ingredient hedging is a consulting education and brokerage firm based out of Chicago. Uh, we work with both agricultural producers and buyers um, to help them manage their risk. Now, we were established back in the late 90s, and it really came out of the financial crisis that we witnessed in the pork industry itself. We recognized the need to not only help educate producers on the tools available to them to help manage their risk, but we also recognize the need to focus objectively on managing margins over time. So today we have about 600 clients across 15 countries, primarily in the Western Hemisphere. Now our bread and butter, no pun intended, uh, is in the hog industry, although we work with producers across the dairy, beef, ethanol, poultry, and, and egg side of things as well. We also work with a number of food companies, um, again, both domestic and international end users. We've got about 80 employees. We're mostly headquartered here in Chicago, although we also have a branch office in Des Moines, Iowa. Now, I work on our education desk. Uh, so in normal times, we're busy out doing, uh, doing classes for clients and for prospects uh, across the country, helping them understand futures, options, and insurance products to help them manage their risk. But again, today we're going to break this presentation into two main parts. The first is going to focus on a market outlook, and the second is going to focus on the pork cutout futures. Now, to begin, we'll talk about some hog fundamentals. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time you know, rehashing what we've all experienced over the past year because we've all already experienced that. But I think there's some important overarching uh, stories here that can come out of the fundamental discussion. Uh, first of all, demand has been pretty strong. Uh, in order to support higher prices as a result of strong demand in the wholesale side of things. Uh, our producers are relatively current and exports to markets not named China have been really strong here in the first part of 2021. But to start things off, let's look at slaughter. So here on, on these charts, these come from our website. Some of you have probably seen them before, uh, but they're all gonna follow a pretty similar uh, pattern here where we can see 2021 in blue, uh, we can see last year 2020 in red and we can see all the way back to 2017. So we can see the last five years of historical hog slaughter. Now for the week ending February 6th, uh, hog slaughter was 2.691 million head in the U.S., which was 1.2 percent higher than the previous week and almost 1 percent higher than a year ago. So you can see that you know overall throughout the first month uh, first five weeks or so of 2021, we've been at or above uh, where we were a year ago. And one thing to also look at, you can see in 2020, what the result of that bottleneck that we saw in packing and processing facilities. Uh, we can see that as we see the dip in April and May uh, before we saw, you know, slaughter ramp back up to levels that, that were needed to clear those hogs in the system. Uh, but overall, slaughter's been pretty strong. Uh, couple that with pretty strong weights as well. So again, for the week ending February 6th, um, for all hogs, the average weight, live weight was 296 versus 289 a year ago. Uh, the dressed estimate for the week ending February 6th was 221 versus 216 a year ago. Uh, but we can see that recently, we've seen daily producer sold carcass weights moderating and coming back closer to levels where we witnessed last year. 
Now, unlike the previous graph, this is showing the last 10 years. But again, 2021 is highlighted in blue. We can see that yesterday, uh, those producers sold weights were averaging just under 215 pounds of carcass weight. In 2020, you know, just slightly lower than where we were yesterday. So only slightly higher than the previous year for our producer sold carcass weights. Well, where we've seen the big difference in carcass weights is when we look at producer versus packer sold. <clears throat> now here on the screen, it's looking over the last 10 years again, but what's being graphed here is packer sold weights minus producer sold weights, or we're looking at the spread between those two values. If we look at last year, 2020 in red, we can see this big ramp up in the difference between packer and producer sold weights once we hit about July or August, wherein the packer sold hogs were much heavier than producer sold hogs. Now that's continued to, to some extent here in 2021. In the last couple of days, this is moderated, so we're getting back closer uh, to more normal levels, but it's definitely something that we've been paying attention to uh, and something that's contributing to overall pork production. Now here we have weekly pork production again for the week ending February 6th. In 2021, we can see highlighted in blue. So for the most recent week for which we have data, we're looking at 594 million pounds of production. Uh, that was about 3.2% higher than a year ago. All right, so pretty, pretty good uh, increase, not only in the number of head, but also the weight of those animals. So USDA is projecting throughout the course of 2021, an annual increase of 1.4%. But that's not all made equal. Uh, so they're looking at an increase in the first half of 2021 of 4.7%, and actually a decrease in the last half of the year of 1.6%. So we're expecting pretty heavy supplies during the first half of the year before a little pullback in the second half of the year. But overall, looking at an increase of 1.4% in 2021. Now, how do we get those numbers? Well, part of it comes from the most recent hogs and pigs report. So what we've got on the screen here uh, are results of the December hogs and pigs report that comes from USDA. Uh, and this is according to survey data on December 1st, looking at hog inventory levels. So by and large, the December report that we had was generally in line with expectations. Again, we get one of these every quarter, so the next one will be coming out in March. Uh, but you can see that overall, the uh, hog inventory levels were, were slightly below where they were in 2019. Um, <clears throat> if there was anything that was surprising, it was probably the, the pig crop was a little bit smaller than, than where some were expecting it to be. Uh, but overall, if we look at the inventory by weight category in the bottom box there on the right, we can see that Supplies in the near term were expected to be plentiful, which is kind of backed up by the slaughter data that we've seen so far. Um, but we start to see potentially a little pullback in production by the time we get to get to the late spring and early summer time periods. And the futures markets are reflecting that right now too. So in 2019, the breeding herd reached its high, highest level in nearly two decades, almost six and a half million head. Uh, but we can see in December 2020, it had pulled back uh, about 3%. Uh, total market inventories also saw a smaller decline of less than 1%. Uh, what I thought was interesting is if we look over the last decade, um, <clears throat> the December 1st total breeding herd has increased by nearly half a million head. Uh, and actually increases in the state of Illinois totaled 90,000 head over the last 10 years of breeding inventory. And that ranked third. Uh, behind only South Dakota and Missouri in total gains over that time period. If we look instead at the market hog inventory over the last decade, that's increased by about 12 million head. Uh, and again, Illinois ranks third in total gains over that time period. Uh, Illinois market inventory has increased a little over a million head, and that ranks only behind Iowa and Minnesota. So <clears throat> that's kind of coming off the hogs and pigs report. Again, we'll get another look next month at the March inventory numbers. Uh, looking at sow slaughter, you know, this is something that we pay attention to to get a better handle of what future production uh, expectations should look like. Um, 
you know, slightly ahead of, ahead of where we were in 2020, although that's been coming down in recent weeks. The most recent day or month for which we have complete data uh, would be December. Um, in December, sow slaughter was 11% higher in December than the previous year, but that was slightly because there is also an extra slaughter day uh, in the month of December in 2020. So, you know, something that we'll continue to pay attention to moving forward. Now, if we look at what does all of this mean for the national negotiated hog price, here we can see over the last five years, um, you know, overall, I would say that given the turmoil that our sector is, is faced over the last year as it results, or as it revolves around the pandemic and, and heavier hogs and increased production, you know, the national negotiated hog prices is, is holding up pretty well there. Uh, for February 10th, uh, which would be yesterday, you know, the value is 65.26, which is almost 30% higher than a year ago, uh, approaching levels that we saw in 2017 and 18, uh, which I think is, is a pretty good story considering where we're at in the cycle. Now, if we look at what does this mean kind of looking forward? Well, if we look at the relationship between lean hog futures and the current CME index, we've got a graph like we've got on the screen right now. So we can see the current year cash index in, in black. Uh, if I can get a drawing tool up here. Here we can see the current year cash index. Now here in blue, we can see the 10-year average of that index. See it peaking in the summer like we typically see before falling into the fall. And here with these hash marks, the blue are 2021 futures. We can see that futures curve out in time. And in red, we have 2022 futures. <clears throat> and we have them up through up through June. Now what's interesting here is we can see that from a seasonal perspective. Not only are we looking at futures prices that are higher than the 10-year average, we're also looking at some futures prices that seasonally are very strong, uh, particularly if we look at July and if we look at August, we can see how much higher it is um, above the seasonal pattern that we typically see. So there's some seasonally attractive price levels out in late summer, which we'll look at here in a second in terms of uh, what does that mean for our overall margins that we're looking at. <clears throat> now, another piece of the puzzle, and we'll get more into this in a little bit, uh, but is looking at cutout reports. <clears throat> now, it's important that we understand exactly what it is we're referring to when we talk about cutout. So typically, when someone refers to cutout, we're talking about the 602 report. Um, the 602 report is what's Fill, uh, feeds into the CME port cutout index, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but here on the top left, we can see a snapshot from the USDA's website uh, and the different cutout purchase types. Now you can see that the negotiated sales are one contract among six different cutout purchase types that are out there. So the most comprehensive cutout type is actually defined as the comprehensive cutout. And it's up here at the top. Um, but even that report itself only contains about 50% or just under 50% of all pork production. Now, as a subset of that, we have the negotiated cutout type. So the negotiated cutout report represents about 30% of the comprehensive cutout. So if we extract that, extrapolate that to total pork production, Negotiated represents about 13.5% of total port production in the 602 report. Uh, we'll get more into the CME index in a bit, but the graph down on the lower right is the percentage of the comprehensive cutout that is negotiated on a week-to-week -week basis. We can see that that goes back to uh, about summer of 2019. Uh, so on average, you know, about 30% of the comprehensive cutout is reflected in the negotiated cutout. So one point here to make also is that Mexico and Canada are both actually included in the domestic cutout purchase type. So in theory, if we have sales to Mexico or to Canada and those sales are negotiated for delivery within 14 days, then those meet the specs to be included in the negotiated sales report. 
Now, if we kind of look at where the 602 has been, uh, here on this chart, we can see over the last five years, we can see this is a ranges chart, wherein we can see the high over the last five years of the 602 port cut uh, carcass cutout. We can see the low in the dotted red line here. The gray line in the middle represents the average over the last five years. We can see 2020 in red. You can see the big dip that we had in the spring before the rise that came from the bottleneck. And we can see where we're at so far in 2021 in blue. So overall, we saw you know, a decent amount of strength into, into mid-October, um, and then a big drop throughout the last part of 2020 uh, after the cutout peaked. The cutout fell by about 30% uh, throughout the fall and early winter. Um, a lot of the strength that we saw in mid-October was due to the belly primal, and the ham primal has recently uh, exhibited some strength, as has the rib. Um, but recently, the cutout overall has been trending higher, and you can see that it's at the highest level that it's been over the last five years or so. Now, almost half of this increase that we've seen in recent weeks has to do with the bellies. Uh, last night, the belly traded at 144, which is 90% higher uh, than last year. So overall, I think that's a pretty good sign. Um, hopefully, it's an indication that potentially food processors are getting more orders from fast food operators and restaurant operators. Hopefully, you know, giving an indication that we might be getting back to a more open economy, uh, which would be a pretty good thing for all of us. Uh, something to keep in mind here is that the Easter is early, and so it might be pulling some demand forward uh, in the near term. Uh, and we typically see a little bit of a waning in demand uh, until we get closer to the summer grilling season. Um, but definitely a, a positive here so far. Similarly, if we look at uh, pork and cold storage, uh, another pretty positive uh, storyline here. Uh, frozen pork supplies were down 3% from the previous month at the end of December. Um, they were down 30% from the previous year. Again, this is a ranges chart. We can see the high in the dotted green line over the last decade. We can see the low over the last decade in the dotted red line. And we can see where we were in 2020. Um, again, quite a bit below where we were uh, in previous years. Never really recovered uh, or built back up stocks uh, after the, the initial supply bottleneck that we saw develop in the spring and early summer. Now from an export, um, from an export perspective, U.S. exports in 2020 were outstanding. Uh, they reached nearly 3 million metric tons in pork and pork products, which tops the 2019 record by 11% on a volume basis. On a value basis, pork exports were also a record. Uh, they were 11% higher than the previous year. Now, <clears throat> one of the negatives of export data is that it's usually lagged by quite a bit. For example, we just recently got December 2020 official data. Um, so we won't be able to see any uh, more recent data for another month or so. But what we do get from FAS, from the Foreign Ag Service at USDA, are weekly export sales numbers. Now, traditionally, these numbers have only covered a, a small percentage of, of total exports throughout the year. Uh, but they have been getting better uh, and covering a larger percentage of overall exports. Now here what we've got on the screen are outstanding pork export sales by calendar year. We can see 2020 uh, you know, started off uh, real strong. And we would typically see these sales turn into actual shipments, at which point they would no longer be outstanding sales. So that's why we typically see this decline into the end of the year. But we can see that, you know, overall, so far in 2021, compared to previous years, we're looking pretty darn good, um, especially if you've removed 2020 from the graph here. So overall, USDA projects exports in 2021 to be about 1.5% lower than a year ago. Um, so, you know, it, it makes sense that we're not quite up to that green line yet. Uh, but overall, you know, pretty decent export sales. If we look at China, so this is a slightly different graph. Again, it's from USDA FAS, but this is total commitments to China. 
So it includes both what has been shipped so far this year, as well as any outstanding sales of pork for this calendar year. So you can see 2020 in green, you know, really leading the charge up at the top. You can see 2021 continues to build, um, you know, because this includes outstanding sales and pork actual exports, um, there's a chance that, you know, these sales could be canceled. So it could come down as we've seen in previous years. Uh, but overall, you know, pretty strong sales. Uh, keep in mind, this is against the backdrop that China is supposedly building their herd back uh, to levels that we last witnessed before ASF. That's according to Chinese government data. Uh, if we look at domestic Chinese pork prices, you know, they still remain pretty elevated, uh, which doesn't really lend any credence to the idea that they're completely rebuilt and, and back to normal. Uh, likewise, if we look at USDA's projections for total pork imports to China. Now, this is from the entire world, not just from the US. Um, but the USDA expects total Chinese pork imports to remain pretty elevated, to come down slightly from what we saw in 2020, but still stay pretty high. So I guess we'll uh, continue to monitor the data there to get a better idea of where we might be standing uh, relative to where the inventory levels were before. Now, one potential real bright spot on the export side of things um, is an area that we haven't really been a major player in in, in a long time or, or maybe ever, and that's the Philippines. So according to USDA, uh, ASF continues to discourage commercial operations from reinvesting in the sector in the Philippines, uh, which in turn has led to spiking consumer pork prices. Now, the Philippines is the seventh largest pork importer in the world. Uh, there's about 100 million Filipinos, uh, which ranks it 12th in the world in total population. So at 100 million, you know, that's, that's pretty close to the population of Mexico or Japan. Um, Mexico is about 120 million. That ranks as the number one pork export market for the U.S. based on volume. Japan has 126 million people. That's the largest export market based on value. So definitely an opportunity here to fill this gap. And that's really what's developing here. Um, the Philippines, you know, set a price ceiling for their pork and chicken as food inflation was soaring throughout the country. Um, additionally, they announced that they plan to triple pork imports. And so there's a real opportunity here. So currently pork exports entering the Philippines are subject to a 30% tariff up to an annual quota of 54,000 metric tons. And anything beyond that, the rate jumps up to 40%. Um, and so those are really among the highest tariff rates of any major import market in the world. And so the hope and expectation here uh, is that hopefully we could see some relief uh, over the next month or two, either in the form of lower tariffs or a larger quota or a combination of the two in order to help fill that demand. And so that's something that we'll be paying attention to. And we've seen this reflected in the data already. This is total port commitments to the Philippines. Again, it's actual shipments plus outstanding sales. And we can see that, you know, if realized, everything that's on the books right now would already count as a record for U.S. exports to Philippines. So this is uh, something that continues to move higher. Uh, I keep having to change the scale on this graph every time I update it. Um, but a, pot a potentially nice little um, tailwind to the industry here if this continues to, to develop. So that's kind of the, the idea on the pork side of things. If we look briefly at, at the feed outlook, you know, starting with corn and then moving into beans, we had an update to the balance sheet that came from USDA on Tuesday uh, in the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates, or WASDE report. And overall, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of change outside of a domestic ending stock decline of 50 million bushels from January. Um, overall, that was kind of at the, it left total ending stocks at 1.5 billion bushels, which was at the higher end of analyst expectations. Uh, but it was completely due to an increase in exports of 50 million bushels. Um, this was kind of on the low end of where most analysts expected that increase to be. Um, probably wasn't enough for a lot of the bulls to be satisfied. Um, we can see that 
you know, it resulted in a stocks to use ratio of about 10.3%, um, you know, a little bit lower than, than where we were back in January. Now, this is something that I kind of like to look at to, you know, how did we get to where we, where we are today from a pricing standpoint? Now, there's a lot of different lines on here, but what we're showing is the stocks to use projections and revisions over time. Now, each one of these lines refers to a different crop year. Now, over on the right, we can see the 2020-21 crop year, which we're currently in. The red line next to it is the 2019-2020 crop year, 18-19, uh, and so on, going back over the last decade. Now, what we've got here is the projected stocks to use ratio from the WASDE report. We can see that back when this, uh, when USDA first projected a stocks to use ratio for the 2020-21 crop year, they had it pegged at about 22%. We can see what's happened throughout time on almost every report since then, they've been revising that number lower to where it is today at 10%. Now we can see a stocks to use ratio of 10% is not unprecedented, uh, but it would be the first time we've seen a measure that low since the 2013, 2014 crop year. Now there's a number of factors that contributed to this, including increased export demand as well as you know, some weather events this past summer that took out production and also took out some storage uh, of old crop. Um, but overall, you know, that's, that's really what's been playing into this rally that we've seen uh, on the corn side of things. I talked about renewed export demand. Uh, this is total commitments of corn to China for this crop year, so 2020-21 crop year in blue. You can see the massive sales numbers that we had uh, two weeks ago. Again, had to change the scale on this in order to fit it. Uh, but you can see that you know, total corn commitments to China are 697 million bushels. Uh, that's 290 times higher than a year ago. So just massive, massive uh, sales uh, to China. Now the conversion of sales to actual shipments is a little bit behind schedule. Uh, so we'll continue to pay attention to that. that and see if those sales continue to turn into shipments. Um, but, you know, this is, has really been the story of the market. Uh, similar story if we look at total corn export commitments to the world. Again, just massive compared to a year ago, up 142% at almost 2.3 billion bushels. So, you know, relatively low stocks to use ratio, relatively strong uh, export sales have led to the current pricing environment that we're in. It's a pretty similar story on soybeans. So if we look at the soybean balance sheet that we got from WASDE on Tuesday, again, the only change to the balance sheet was an increase in exports of 20 million bushels. So that was right in line with analyst expectations. Uh, USDA did not adjust their Brazilian soybean crop estimate. Uh, they did not change uh, their Argentinian soybean estimate, and they did not change China's balance sheet from January. So there's really not a whole lot of change. You can see the stocks to use ratio uh, was decreased down to 2.6%. Contrast that with where we ended for last crop year at 13%, and you can see the tightness that's developed on the soybean side of things. Now, again, if we look at the stocks to use projections and revisions, this reads similar to the corn one. We can see the 2020-21 crop year here in blue. You can see at one point, USDA had projected that um, at 14%. And that's been revised lower as a result of you know, weather events throughout the summer, as well as really strong export demand. Uh, you can see overall, it wasn't that long ago that we had a stocks to use ratio above 20%. Now, once again, a stocks to use ratio of 3% is not unprecedented, but again, it's, it's the lowest that we've seen since the 2013-14 crop year. Uh, so again, that's what's kind of feeding into the rallies that we've seen over the last several weeks. If we look from an export percent or perspective, 
Uh, bean commitments to the world are up 84% from a year ago. Uh, a lot of that is driven by strength to the Chinese market. Again, keep having to change the scale, uh, but total soybean commitments to China are up 195% from a year ago. <clears throat> now, one of the factors here too has been South American weather. Here on the screen, on the left, we can see the soil moisture drought indicator uh, throughout South America. In the middle, we see accumulation, and on the right, we see soybean production areas in Argentina and Brazil. Now, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag, but we know that there was a pretty strong delay uh, in getting a getting planting done in Brazil, in Argentina, by at least two weeks. And so that's really pushed everything back by at least those two weeks. Uh, they continue to have rain showers today. Uh, and so that's really pushed soybean harvest back. Uh, if we look at the major Brazilian soybean growing state of Mato Grosso, Soybean harvest is unlikely to reach 50% until probably early March. It's currently 11% complete. Uh, on average, it's about 32% complete and it's 44% done last year. So, so definitely a delay there. Uh, but overall, you know, Brazil's Minister of Agriculture recently confirmed that they're still gonna have bumper bean and corn crops despite the early problems that they had this season. And so we'll continue to pay attention to the data coming out of the fields there. All of that to say, so this is where we're at today. So if we're looking out to say third quarter of 2021, um, you know, what kind of opportunities do we have out there? <clears throat> well, answering good or bad is, is kind of tough. So instead we like to look at a more objective approach and, and to do that, we look at historical percentiles. And so each one of these columns represents uh, a different component of the margin. We can see corn here, soybean meal, lean hogs, and the overall open market margin. So when we talk about percentiles, we're looking over the last decade, where was the high and where was the low? We can see a corn price for third quarter, which would, uh, which would be September 2021 corn, is currently at $4.71. Now that's at the 72nd percentile. In other words, 72% of the time, September corn has been below that price level over the past decade. And the other 28% of the time, corn price has been higher than that for September. Now we can look at that individually for corn, meal, and bean, but the most important part here that we pay attention to is the open market margin. And we're currently looking at an open market margin of $8.37 a hundredweight. Now that ranks in the 70th percentile, meaning that 70% of the time, the open market margin has been below that price level or below that level. So it's looking pretty darn good, uh, you know, several months out ahead of time to begin protecting this uh, and beginning to chip away at coverage, which we have a number of, of clients doing today. Uh, they can do, you can do this, you know, a number of different ways, whether it's in, in fixed or flexible strategies, uh, but definitely, despite all the turmoil, despite the run-up in feed costs that we've seen, uh, being able to lock in or protect an open market margin ranking at the 70th percentile is, is a pretty good opportunity um, this far out in time. And we're happy to, to discuss any of those strategies if, if anyone would like to get in touch about them. But that kind of covers it from a, from a market outlook perspective. Um, I'm gonna switch gears here and change to something that I think is, is really exciting for the pork sector as a whole. And I, I think it's an important tool that we now have at our disposal to really increase the effectiveness of our risk management decisions. And that's the pork cutout futures. So there's really three things I wanna, I wanna cover in this. Is first and foremost, I wanna just briefly explain the genesis of the contract. Um, I wanna review what exactly goes into the cutout. Uh, and then we're gonna look at three different examples of how the cutout could aid uh, a risk management approach and, and make it customizable for a producer in their own exposure. So <clears throat> kind of starting off, you know, just theoretically, we talk about futures markets a lot and, and we talk about futures markets because they tend to be correlated with your local cash price or the cash price that you ultimately receive or pay. Um, you know, down on the bottom, 
we got a hypothetical curve drawn here where we have futures in blue and the local cash price or the cash price that you receive in green. And you can see, even though those don't move completely one for one with one another, they tend to move in the same direction. And for that reason, futures prices are typically used as a bench price or a benchmark for projecting both revenue and costs into deferred periods. Now, the closer that those two price series move together, the more correlated they are. Uh, it's a, a way that we can mathematically describe that relationship. And the more correlated the cash and futures are, the more effective that derivative or that futures contract is to be used as a hedge. But when that relationship between those two price series breaks down, you know, the confidence that one can have in the futures as a hedging instrument uh, is also diminished. And so <clears throat> that's, uh, that's really kind of the genesis or the idea behind uh, doing a hedge is to replace or be used as a substitute for the eventual purchase or sale uh, of physical. And so futures, especially port futures, have, have developed over time and, and evolved over time. So port bellies began trading back in 1961. Uh, that was replaced with, with hog futures in, in 1966. Um, those moved to a lean basis in 97, and then a financial settlement replaced physical delivery for hogs in 2003. Um, but what exactly is the lean hog index? A lean hog index is calculated by the CME group, and it refers to the 201 report from the USDA. The lean hog index is simply a two-day weighted average of the daily price and volume for three specific purchase types. Now those purchase types are negotiated, Swiner pork market formula. Now the negotiated formula category was, was added. Uh, that's probably been about five or six years now ago. Uh, and quite often the, the volume on that is really low. So by and large, it's mostly made up of Swiner pork market formula and to a lesser extent negotiated hogs. Now most of you have probably seen and are pretty familiar with the 201 report. Uh, but here we've got it on the screen. This is from last March. You can see in each one of these columns, it refers to a different purchase type or what people often refer to as buckets. So we can see the negotiated bucket here, uh, futures and options uh, price hogs here, Swiner pork market formula, and then negotiated formulas over on the end. And then the last category is called the other purchase arrangement. And that's really a catch-all category. Uh, for anything that doesn't fit neatly into one of the other buckets. Now, this has grown over time uh, and quite often will contain uh, hogs that contain some sort of non-carcass merit premium in their pricing uh, arrangement. But if we're looking for the lean hog index, you know, we're just taking the weighted average of these three categories uh, and taking the two-day average of that in order to figure out what the lean hog contract would settle to. So it's relatively straightforward. <clears throat> now if we look at purchase type volumes over time, uh, it's, it's relatively interesting. We can see macro level trends that we're all probably pretty familiar with. Uh, but we can see, you know, the fact that the negotiated animals has remained pretty small and a diminishing part of overall slaughter. And see packer owned is, has grown over time. You can see swine report market formula has, has remained one of the larger categories over time. And the other purchase arrangement or the, that catch all category has also grown uh, over this time frame. But if we look particularly at the three purchase types that feed into the lean hog index, I've got those highlighted here. You can see that. By and large, the majority of them are swine report market formula hogs. Now, swine report market formula hogs contain animals that are priced both on the cash market as well as the cutout market. Now, if we look at the relationship, we can say that about one third of the move in the lean hog index is a result of the cutout, uh, of, of moves in the cutout. We'll talk about that here in a second. But this is kind of the, the overall volume makeup. 
Now, we all know this, but if we look at the pricing differences between the different purchase types, we can also see pretty significant spreads over time. So this is Barrow and Gilt base price by purchase type since 2015. You can see that by and large, the negotiated animals tend to be lower in price and see that by and large, the other purchase arrangement hogs tend to be higher in price. So there's significant deviation between the different purchase types. And there's even deviation within each purchase type. Now, USDA publishes a swine contract library wherein packers are required to submit to USDA their pricing mechanisms for any of the animals that are in the swine report market formula category. Now, what we've done is built a tool on our website for our clients to look at, to analyze how they stack up against their peers for their packer contracts. Now here on the screen, we can see the base price distribution for swine report market formula hogs uh, on February 10th, 2021, so yesterday. And we can see that distribution over time. Now this doesn't tell us how many hogs are priced at this, but it tells us based on the number of contracts in the swine contract library, this is the distribution of, of those base prices. Now we can see that for just yesterday alone, we saw a range in base prices from 45 bucks all the way up to 88 bucks. Now we can see a large cluster uh, of contracts that had a base price around 65 to 67 dollars. Uh, as well as another cluster around $71 to $72. But overall, we, I mean, the, the main takeaway here is that there's a wide variety of base prices, um, even within uh, one category itself, in this case, Swine Report Market Formula. So if you are a producer that's receiving a base price at either one of these tails, the Lean Hog Index probably hasn't done a very good job of representing your risk that you face with your hogs. <clears throat> so again, producers, animals can be priced using cash hogs, the cutout, or some combination of the two. And traditionally, it's worked pretty well as a hedging instrument. Um, but as more and more hogs got priced off of the cutout, um, you know, pricing methods change, and so too uh, does the, do, does the uh, the futures contract as well. And so <clears throat> because the CME lean hog index is a weighted average of several different purchase types, there can develop a deviation between what a producer is actually receiving and where that lean hog index may be. And so in periods of extreme disruption, we can see a deviation between the live animal and the product prices. And that's exactly what we've seen over the last year or so. <clears throat> Now here on the screen, we can see the lean hog index in, in black. We can see the cutout in blue. And we can see the significant deviation that develops at times in extreme periods, such as last spring, um, even through the summer. And, and it's this gap between the two price series <clears throat> that calls into question the effectiveness of the lean hog index um, as a hedging instrument for, for some producers, depending on how they're animals are priced. Now up here on the, on the left, I've got a, uh, a table that shows the correlation between the lean hog index and the cutout over different time periods. So if we look at a long time horizon from January 2014 through last December, the correlation between those two price series has been pretty strong at 92%. But you can see as we shrink the time frame that we're looking at, we see that correlation break down. Um, and a lower correlation, again, implies a lower confidence in being able to use the lean hog index uh, as a hedging instrument or an effective hedging instrument. <clears throat> so that was really the genesis of the port cutout futures. And so CME Group began listing these on November 9th. The cutout futures are settled to the CME pork cutout index. So the port cutout index is simply a five-day weighted average of the 602 report. So it takes all it takes five days in a row, which is, is a positive, uh, to remove some volatility. And it's also a load weighted average. So if one day has low volume, it doesn't uh it doesn't drastically change 
uh, the cutout index itself. But otherwise, the specifications of the cutout futures are almost identical to lean hog futures. And we believe that it's a really important addition for producers to be able to customize the risk management approach in addition with their lean hog futures to more closely align their hedging strategy with their cash price discovery. And I'll show you what I mean by that here um, over a course of three examples. But um, by and large, what we're utilizing are regressions in order to help us determine the best mix of lean hog index and pork cutout index in order to, to include in our hedging strategy. So the idea here is that we want to minimize the deviation between our futures exposure and the cash price that a producer would ultimately receive. So we can utilize the regressions to develop these hedge ratios that will improve the correlation between our futures position performance and the cash price that we'll receive. And again, we're gonna look at three examples here. So the first example that we're gonna talk about is probably the most obvious and straightforward use for port cutout futures. Um, but that's for a producer whose hogs are priced on 90% of the 602 report. So up top, um, and the next three slides are going to follow a pretty similar pattern here. Um, but up top here, we can see the 90% of the 602 report, which is in blue. And in green, we can see it's just simply the lean hog index. Now you can see that the lean hog index is at times not a very good representation of 90% of cutout. Um, there's at times a really significant deviation or, or gap that forms uh, between the two price series. Now overall the correlation is, is about 74%. Now down below uh, we can see that we have a regression model in green. And again, in blue, we have the 90% cutout. And we can see that overall, um, <clears throat> just visually, it's a dramatic improvement as far as representing this producer's or this specific example contracts uh, relationship. And you can see that from the correlation as well that jumps from 74% up top down to 98% uh, at the bottom by using this, this blend of lean hog and pork cutout futures. Uh, that one's relatively straightforward. Um, we can also look at a cash-based contract. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the national negotiated cash uh, plus $3.50. So again, up top, it's the same graph. You can see the lean hog index in green. And then you can see the national uh, cash plus 350 example contract in blue. And if we really look over the last year or so, we can see some significant deviation uh, between the two series. So lean hog index has not converged very well with, with negotiated cash uh, during that time frame. I, it was never expected to or, or designed to do that um, but because it comes from the 201 report and primarily from the Swine Report market formula. So we know that within Swine Report market formula, there's a lot of contracts that have cutout exposure, uh, whether they're wholly priced off of cutout or partially priced off of cutout. Uh, but it's those hogs in that category that have caused this deviation right here. Now, if we look down at the bottom, again, it's the same graph. We have the, exa the example contract in blue. Uh, and we have, a blend of lean hog and pork cutout futures in green. So you can see that overall it's a better representation, but it doesn't completely eliminate basis risk. It, it's never going to completely eliminate basis risk, but it does dramatically improve it. Uh, it's a much better model to base your risk management on than what we've had in the past, which is simply lean hog. We can see that overall the correlation between the two increases from 92% to 97% as well. Now the last example that we're going to talk about uh, is a blend uh, contract. Um, in this case, it's a 50-50 combination of the prior two contracts that we've talked about. 
And it seems as though there's a lot of these sort of, of blended exposure contracts out there. And so for some of these, the lean hog index has actually done a pretty decent job uh, of representing uh, the cash price risk. Uh, again, lean hog index in green, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, again, the lean hog index in green and, and this example contract in blue. You know, overall, pretty good correlation between the two. Um, but the reason the lean hog index is a pretty good approximation for some blends is that it itself is a blend of a lot of different packer contracts. <clears throat> uh, again, down at the bottom, we can see that there is a slight improvement uh, in, in the correlation be between the two series. You know, there still exists some deviation. Uh, but in particular, when you need the hedge to work the most, in other words, when, when the markets are very, very low, that's when this methodology tends to outperform the lean hog index in and of itself. <clears throat> so what are these blends that we're looking at and, and how would we actually implement this? <clears throat> well, when we, when we uh, start the rollout of the port cutout futures, we developed a number of different tools on our website for our clients and we're happy to discuss this for, for you and your needs if, if you'd like to. Uh, but what we've done is be able to look exactly at what the hedge ratios for these should be. And so if we think back to that first example of 90% of the 602 uh, cutout exposure, when we run a regression, it spits out a lot of different numbers for us, uh, including an intercept and, and coefficients. But we can use those coefficients as the ratio or exposures that our hedge needs to have to both lean hogs and cutouts in order to address the specific contract's risk. So for example, here on the 90% cutout, when we run the regression, it spits out coefficients of negative 0 0.03 for the lean hog ratio and 0 0.91 for the cutout ratio. So it's not super important to get down to the hundredth or the thousandth of decimal here. Um, there's always going to have to be some rounding that takes place. But in this case, what this is saying is that in order to hedge 10 loads of production with a 90% of 602 pricing arrangement, you would need to sell nine pork cutout futures, <clears throat> which that makes sense. Um, if you're 90% of cutout, you would need to sell nine loads. Uh, you wouldn't sell one to one um, because you need to match up the P and L of your hedge with the economic impact of a market move. So, in other words, if the cutout rallies ten bucks and you sold ten futures, you would lose all ten dollars of that rally, whereas your physical hogs would only gain nine bucks. So, you need to match up the economic impact of a move with your hedge P and L uh, with the cutout. <clears throat> so, it just becomes a simple hedge ratio. So, that's that's relatively straightforward. You can see the correlation here is 97%, which indicates that it's very strong. Now, if we look at the cash base uh, contract, the national plus 350, um, this one might take a little bit longer to kind of wrap your head around, but it's, it definitely makes sense. And so what we're getting here is a lean hog ratio of about 1.5 and a cutout ratio of about negative 0.5. So what this is telling us is that to hedge 10 loads of hog production, we would need to actually sell 15 contracts of lean hog futures and simultaneously buy five contracts of cutout. So there's a spread component here. Um, <clears throat> but if you think about it, you know, it's, it's a swine report market formula that causes the deviation. So stated technically about one third of the movements in the lean hog index can be explained by movement and cutout. So if you apply that rule of thumb to the 15 contracts of lean hogs that we sold, we'd say that five of those 15 contracts are cutout exposure, which this producer doesn't want. And so we offset that cutout exposure by buying back uh, those cutouts. Now on the left, we can see that this has a correlation of 96%. So again, it's a really good model 
uh, or methodology to use to address the cash only contracts. And finally, if we look at the blend uh, of 50% of the 90% cutout and 50% of the national plus 350, uh, that's spitting out a lean hog ratio of 0 0.74 lean hog and 0 point about two cutout contracts. So in other words, it's saying you wouldn't go ahead and do 50-50 if you have 10, 10 loads. You wouldn't sell 10 lean hogs and sell 10 cutouts. Rather, you would sell seven lean hog futures and sell two cutout futures uh, to achieve a correlation of about 97%. Um, <clears throat> so again, the, the point is that if you have a blended contract, you don't just run with the face blend of the contract overall, but rather need to need to look at the regression coefficients here in order to figure out the optimal hedge ratio. Improve the correlation and ultimately improve uh, the effectiveness uh, of the hedge itself. <clears throat> so again, we can do that with individual contracts. Uh, we can do it with all of your hogs uh, as a whole, as a portfolio, in order to figure out where it makes sense to, uh, to line up your hedge in order to, to model your cash price exposure. But we really do think that the cutout is a, is a really important addition to the toolbox at your disposal, in addition with lean hog futures, um, as well as you know, insurance products from, from USDA. Again, it allows for further customization for producers, uh, and it fits really nicely into existing margin management programs that, that you're probably implementing or, or looking to implement. Down here at the bottom, I've got daily port cutout volume from CME. We can see that you know it's been growing pretty nicely since it first rolled out in this, in November. Um, you know, we've continued to set new records. It, there does seem to be momentum going. Uh, options are also available, and those seem to be growing in, in recent trading sessions as well. And so volume and open interest aren't quite where they're at, obviously, for, for an established contract like the Lean Hog Index. Um, but overall, I think there's definitely momentum building, and, uh, and that's a good thing for, for you as producers and, and for us as a sector uh, in order to you know, have another important tool at our disposal and uh, if any of you would like to talk about how this could fit into your plan or, or how it might help you in taking control of your bottom line happy to discuss that with you uh, offline as well so thank you again to illinois port for the opportunity to to talk to you guys uh, i know I'd much rather be in person but but i appreciate the the invitation to speak to you all virtually and uh, if you have any questions about anything that we've talked about or, or any of the data that we discussed, uh, happy to answer them. And thanks again for the opportunity.